Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text recorded in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. As the truth is in Jesus. This story falls under the category of some things are so weird you just can't make them up. A few years ago, Lisa and I were invited to a Blanc birthday party. Blanc is French for white, and at this party, everyone was supposed to wear white. Literally, all white. White from head to toe, including the Pat Boone dress shoes. <laughs> ah, some of you got it. I knew you would. Yeah. At first, I just thought they were making this up, but this is actually a real thing. Dinner in Blanc, or white dinner party, well, it's real as far as the French go, so, you know, go figure. Unfortunately, we had a previous engagement, so we were not able to attend. Fortunately, we had a previous engagement, so <laughs> I didn't have to waste money on white pair of shoes and a white belt and white pants that I would never wear again unless I went into the house painting business. But again, unfortunately, we were not there because the guest of honor, the birthday boy, one of my members, had a heart attack at his own block party, but that's not the weird part. The weird part is when the local volunteer EMTs and firefighters showed up at the end of the country drive, greeted by a guest wearing all white, and then were led into a house party where all the guests were wearing all white, and then they checked on the respiration and pulse of a patient wearing all white before they loaded him into the white ambulance to take him to the ER. Okay? That got weird. Now, that's a birthday party everybody's going to remember. And one that the birthday boy, who survived the heart attack quite well, by the way, lived to talk about. We just love to dress up and pretend we are someone else, don't we? Indeed. Did you know that the second retail holiday where the most money is spent, second only to Christmas, is Halloween? And it's not just the fake, fake plastic pumpkins and the bags of Reese's peanut butter cups for the kids. It's the costumes, especially the costumes for the adults and the parties, especially the adult parties. I would love to be invited to a Halloween party for adults, but since I would simply put on my black shirt and black suit and pretend to be a Roman Catholic priest... I don't think I would win any prizes for the best costume. So the question is, as we begin the second half of Ephesians chapter 4, have we as Christians grown really, really good at pretending to be someone else? Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Now, come on, pastor. Are people really as bad as the Bible seems to say that they are? darkened in their understanding, alienated from God, filled with ignorance, hearts that are hard, indeed hearts that have become hard and callous and cold, submerged in sexual sensuality and impurity, greedy to practice sin and practice it more and more. Now, whether or not you believe Paul's description of human depravity to be accurate depends a great deal on how much human depravity you have personally experienced in your own life. And I mean that both ways. Both what others have done to you and perhaps what you have done unto others. 
the sins done unto you and the sins that have been done by everyone else. Be that as it may, it's, it's kind of easy here to miss Paul's point. What is life like without God? What is the mindset, attitude of those outside a relationship with God? Futile, pointless, meaningless. Indeed, one of the reasons for the rising immorality in our society today is the rising of faithlessness, the lack of faith in anyone greater than the self. As more and more Americans walk away from God, away from the church, away from religion, what are they walking toward? What kind of life and lifestyle are they walking into? Is it a lifestyle of morality and truth? Or is it simply a lifestyle of self-centeredness and sensuality? Pew Research recently did a survey asking a very basic question. Where do Americans find meaning and purpose in life? Now answer that question in your own mind right now. Where do you find meaning and purpose in life? And I find the results both heartening and disheartening at the same time. Of the nine top responses to the question, where do you find meaning, spirituality and faith come in fourth. Right below money and career. Indeed, only 20% of Americans say that their faith life is where they find meaning and purpose. 23% find it in money, good old-fashioned greed. 34% find it in their careers, workaholics that we are. Now, I don't really find that surprising, given the state of the Christian church in America today. The fact that only 20% of Americans find their primary purpose and meaning in life from their faith, in their local church, God's word, is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, but you got to turn the light on, folks. And the light of God's word, the truth of Jesus, is not what many people are finding at their local church. But what I do find heartening about this study, done just last November, last year, is that 69% of Americans look for meaning and purpose in one place. Family. Family. Simply spending time with family. Indeed, those from the survey who placed faith and spirituality high also placed family as one of the primary ways of finding meaning and purpose in life. Christ-centered, Bible-based, what's next? Family-focused. Family-focused. And folks, what happens when those two merge? Our faith and our family, both are strengthened. Both become foundations upon which to build. Both become a better reason to get out of bed in the morning than money, career, hobbies, even friendships. And it need not be faith or family, but a family that worships, a family that prays, a family that grows together in faith. Amen? Thus Paul reminds us, don't live like you've never met Christ. Don't walk like the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. For you are saints, one with Christ Jesus, one body, one family. Ephesians 4, 20-21. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Truth and Jesus. Today is Reformation Sunday. 502 years ago, a Roman Catholic priest named Martin Luther set out to reform the Christian church which had strayed from the truth of Jesus. Things today in the Christian church are not that far from where they were in Martin Luther's day. The church in Luther's day was teaching that God's grace wasn't enough. That faith in Christ and Christ alone wasn't enough. That man had to add to what Jesus had done on the cross. 
And that while Jesus' death on the cross would mostly pay the price of man's sin and sensuality and greed and alienation, well, it didn't quite do it all. Man had to put in their fair share through works of the law, paying for their forgiveness along the way. But what Martin Luther rediscovered was simply the truth, the truth about Jesus. What is that truth? What does Jesus mean when he says, he is the truth? John 14, 6. Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The truth is that there is no other way to get to God the Father, no other way to get to heaven other than through Jesus. But it's also important to understand here that Jesus was not just simply saying that he spoke the truth or that the truth can be found in him, but that he is the truth. That the source of all truth is found in Christ, the Son of God. Later in his epistle, the Apostle John puts it like this, 1 John 5, 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. Now, look at that carefully. It doesn't say know him who is the truth. It just says him who is true. And we are in him who is true. In his son, Jesus Christ, he is the true God and eternal life. And if we know this truth, if we recognize the truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, then why do we as Christians so often pretend to be someone else? Meaning, is our Sunday morning Christianity different than our Monday morning workplace? Do we think, act, and talk differently out there in the community than we do here in the congregation? Are we the same person out there as we are in here? Now, folks, that is a question I have to ask myself daily as well. One of the things about being a pastor is that you can literally wear the role. You can put on that black clerical collar and pretend to be much holier and much more righteous than you feel beneath. Indeed, on the rare occasions when I make the hospital visit while wearing my clergy garb, it's amazing how differently I am welcomed and how differently I am seen by the hospital staff and nurses. Years ago, I was doing an emergency hospital visit on a Sunday afternoon after church, and I was dressed all in black, dinner lenore, you know, dinner in black, and I got onto the elevator and I pressed the button and a floor up, a lady joined me for the ride, and she kind of looked me up and down and she says, oh, hello, Father, she said. Assuming I was a good Catholic priest making my hospital visits on a Sunday afternoon after Mass. So I opened up my billfold and I showed her pictures of my kids. <laughs> it was an interesting elevator ride. <laughs> the truth. The truth of Jesus leads us to another truth. The truth of who we already are in Christ Jesus. The truth of who Jesus desires us to be when we walk out into the world. The Apostle Paul continues, Ephesians 4, 21 through 22. As the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former way of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Indeed, we as Christians are called to put on a new garment, a new outfit, a totally different Halloween costume, if you will, to put off our old self and to be clothed with this new self, which looks a lot like Christ himself, because that's what it is. Saints, called, chosen, predestined, forgiven, blessed, 
Rooted. Rooted in Christ. Rooted in truth. Rooted in the truth of what Christ has done for us and what Christ continues to do for us each day. To daily put to death our old self so that our new self, which is Jesus himself, can rise out of the ashes of our life and live out his life in us. Paul then finishes off this chapter in some very, very practical examples of how this is supposed to look, how this actually takes place in our Christian life. And most of it simply has to do with simply being the same person you are here on Sunday morning as on Monday morning. Ephesians 4.25, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Loving one another enough to speak the truth, but to speak that truth in a loving way. Ephesians 4, 26 through 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. What does that mean, to not let the sun go down on your anger? To deal with our relational problems on a daily basis. To resolve conflict before it becomes unresolvable. Especially, I might add, in our families, in our marriages, the place where we find meaning and purpose. Ephesians 4, 28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, so that he may have something to share with everyone in need. To be honest and truthful in our work settings, our occupations, to find purpose in our work by making an honest living. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. That word for corrupting there is actually where we get the word rust. Our coffee conversations can build up and give grace to those who hear, or they can corrupt, rusting away our relationships with one another. Ephesians 4.30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Once again, knowing that we are already children of God, that our place in eternity is already secure, not by the things that we do, not by the decisions that we make, not by the prayers that we pray, but by the grace of God. We now live as children of God, as a family of faith. And finally, Ephesians 4.31-32, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. The truth is Jesus. The truth of who we are already because of his grace, and the truth of who we can daily become and be, as we learn how to live out that truth, the truth of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.